So I think it would be nice to start with a round of introductions. Um, I know most of you, but not all of you. So um, I'll be badgering on about my life um, in SEM uh, through uh, the presentation I'm going to give. Um, uh, so uh, I was active in SEM from 1984 onwards um, and became more involved with WSCF stuff in the 90s. Um, but I've had no contact with SEM pretty much since then until this year. So that's me. Um, David? My name's David Gill. I'm a, a minister of the Uniting Church, retired. I worked on the staff of the Australian Student Christian Movement back in the 1960s, and then subsequently worked with the World Council of Churches in Geneva and the uh, what became the National Council of Churches in, in Sydney in Australia. And in between the two, I was working in the national office of the Uniting Church. But the best job of the lot was when I was pastor of Kowloon Union Church in Hong Kong. Right, thanks. Um, Robbie? Hi, uh, like Michael, I joined SCM in 1984. I was at Macquarie University and I did a, a BA and an MA in philosophy at, at Macquarie, then uh, worked for 30 years for Ozide. Uh, in the international aid program and uh, uh, finished up there uh, four years ago. And uh, now I'm doing a range of things with different churches and also on climate change. Great. Uh, Andrew? Oh, sorry, I'm muting. Hi, Andrew Francis here. Um, I, I joined SCM in 1990 after learning about it in Taze in France when I was having a gap year. So I went to Sydney Uni in 1990 and, and found the SCM, which was a, just a wonderful uh, thing to have landed into. And um, I guess I was at Sydney Uni and New South Wales Uni. Um, and I later on from in the late 90s had a role in the WSCF um, Exco for, for four years. Yep. Uh, Chris. Hey, um, I joined SCM in 1974 at ANU and uh, went to my first WSCF event in assembly in 1977 and um, was active in the leadership of both the Australian movement and the WSCF um, in one way or another from then through to gosh, 2003 <laughs> uh, in various capacities. And I worked for ecumenical organizations in Australia, Hong Kong and Geneva. And the best boss I ever had was David. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy you a beer for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in this century, I, I returned to um, uh, to do my PhD in theology. I started in science and finished in theology and have an interest in technological culture. I did my th um, theology degree in Canberra at St. Mark's Theological Centre, CSU, and have lived in Canberra and married to Jeff, who's the silent person sitting beside me. He's, he's eavesdropping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can nap Hello, Jeff. <laughs> um, yeah, about 21 years ago, and I'm now uh, effectively retired and active in local parish stuff and writing. And yeah, that's sort of, that's enough. Yeah, great. Yep. Um, uh, John, do you want to go next? Hi, everyone. I'm John. I'm the outgoing national coordinator. I'm quite mindful that uh, we, we, we are almost 22 past five. So um, I'm going to keep it brief. Yeah. Good. OK, thanks, John. Ros? Nice. John's always extremely humble whether we're on time or not. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ros. Um, I joined SCM in uh -huh. 2008. 
at the University of Western Australia when I was an undergraduate. Um, I uh, became part of the National Executive in 2011 as the WSCF liaison officer. And um, I was also vice chairperson for Asia Pacific, um, WSCF for a while there. I um, graduated from my PhD in 2017, so no longer a student. And these days I work in parliament in the Senate um, at the moment for the Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS, but I work for other committees as well. Um, I'm married to an SCMA. Um, who I met at an WSCF event. He's Indonesian. And I think most of you saw our, our adorable son earlier who's <laughs> taking much of my time at the moment. <laughs> Lovely to meet those of you who I don't know. Great, thanks, Roz. Um, Julia, do you want to introduce yourself? You'll have to unmute. You're on mute, Julia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it now. Mm -hmm. that's, that's cool, yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm Julia. Um, I have a Bible college background. I actually found SCM on the web. Um, when I sent an email asking if SCM um, could support me in starting a group at um, Australian Catholic University, the new campus at Blacktown. Um, that didn't actually work out. We weren't allowed to start a group, but Mandy's brought me on board and I've met, met up with her. It's great. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Julia. Welcome, Julia. Thanks. Terrific. Hi. Um, Sandy? Uh, Sandy, you. Um, I was General Secretary of SCM between 1970 and 1975 and joined the SCM in 1959. <laughs> uh, so the SCM has uh, been my formation as a thoughtful Christian. Uh, I thank the church for being Christian, but the thoughtful bit came with SCM. Uh, that's enough from me for the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. And Mandy? Mandy, uh, so I'm, I, I thank the SCM for thoughtfulness and um, opening my eyes to many things. And uh, I've been active in the Australian Student Christian Movement and WSCF Asia Pacific in different ways. Great, thanks. So I'm, I'm glad that we did all introduce ourselves. I think um, uh, the possibility for this discussion series is that um, we have a record of some very interesting and insightful presentations, um, but we are a, a great group of people. Um, and uh, it was actually my idea to run this discussion series. Um, and I just thought um, the SEM has produced some amazing people and they've gone on to do amazing things. Um, and all of us, I think, can point to something about SCM that has created us. And I've, I've heard some of your comments about thoughtfulness. And when I was thinking about how SCM has influenced my life, thoughtfulness is actually quite a, a good word. Uh, I guess my current work, um, is research. I'm uh, doing AusAid kind of work, actually, Robbie, um, through the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. So I find myself in Pakistan. Um, well, not at the moment. Um, COVID put a stop to that. Um, but I, I think through SCM, I learned the notion of respect. So even though I, I'm working very closely with a lot of very devout Muslims uh, through my project work. I just admire their, um, their goodness. Um, so I, I guess that's, that's something that I wanted to, um, to see from SEM how that had shaped me. So this is going to be a little bit of a going down memory lane. Um, so I'm going to put up some pictures. Although I better just make sure I go to the beginning. Hold on. Technology. I'm getting there. 
Okay, now I can share my, hopefully, yep. you're seeing yeah. Australian Student Christian Movement New South Wales Area Council Discussion Series. So That's I good. really wanted to... Michael, we're seeing the full um, show, not only your main slide. Uh, okay, yep, thank you. I know how to do this. <laughs> okay. Stop share. It's very impressive that you've been able to get pictures together, Michael. That's <laughs> I had fun. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, I know what I need to do. This happened once before and I was very embarrassed because I had to run a, a um, meeting. I'll make it down there and then I'll make it big and I'll share this one. Okay, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll just show it like this. Um, so yes, the the first picture that I wanted to show to you uh, shows me in 1985. Uh, there's some familiar faces that you can see there. Marion Maddox. Yep. Yep. Marion Mary Maddox, Russell Peterson. That's correct. Robbie oh. Tulip is there. Carolyn Reid, Andrew Bernard. Carolyn. And Mandy's got uh, a foot in front of her face. Yes, I thought it might be. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's how I started. So that's actually in 1985. And I believe that photo was taken when Marion and I came back from our uh, experience in Indonesia. So Marion and I uh, joined um, the, what was then called the Human Resources Development Program. Um, that's a sort of month long, um, education, um, skills development kind of program. And it was held in Indonesia. So I've, I've put that slide up there and I'm curious to see if anybody can find out something a little bit strange. And why is the US there? Uh, yes, um, that was, uh, 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 we had a couple of people who came from the US for that particular uh -huh. conference. Okay. It was an interesting time to be in Indonesia. So this is 1985. As a resident of Indonesia expert, I feel like I should know this, but I'm really struggling to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, it is when uh, it was under the Suharto regime. So when I was going through my photos and I saw this and I thought, hang on a minute, there's zero militarization in Indonesia? That doesn't sound right to me. Um, and this was the reality that um, we discovered. So um, Yong Ting Jin was the Asia Pacific Regional Secretary. Um, and towards the end of the conference, we couldn't understand why the Indonesian SCM were being so pro-government the whole time. They, were, they weren't being critical of the government. And then one of, one of the SCMers um, befriended me and she pulled me aside and she said, you realize that there are <coughs> um, what she called spies. There were people there um, who were there to monitor what we were doing. And the Indonesian SCMers were dead scared. And fair enough too. They had um, legitimacy to be scared, particularly because the Philippines SCMers were very gung-ho about East Timor. And that um, as an international movement, we needed to show solidarity through the people of East Timor who were suffering. And so even the mention of East Timor would flag 
huge concern. And Andrew Francis and I um, were resource people at a Indonesian conference just before the end of the Suharto regime as, um, as uh, buildings in Jakarta were being burned. I think we arrived around about that time. Um, and the shift was remarkable. Um, I remember it was one of the scariest events of my life was um, arriving in Indonesia, having filled out a, um, a, a customs declaration to say I had no videos with me, um, whereas indeed I had a, a video um, all about East Timor. And I just knew that I was going to be held uh, at the airport, um, put away, um, sent back to Australia. Um, and at that stage, I was working for the International Trade Union. Um, and I just thought of all the um, consequences that would arise from that. Fortunately, um, I got through without any problem and um, I was able to show that video, which went down um, uh, immensely well. But I want to um, tell you about the people that I met at that very first SEM conference. Um, and there's Tetsuro and there's Niran. So Niran was a representative from Thailand, Tetsuro from Japan, and they remain very good friends of mine to this day. Um, now, I've, of course, had a lot to do with Thailand over the years because I did my master's there. And um, Niran was the person who uh, helped me understand um, what, uh, so my master's was about the Mekong Basin. And he taught me that there's this wonderful whiskey called Mekong that we should drink every night so that you can do your research on the Mekong Basin. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, we spent, um, I ended up living in the Student Christian Center where he was working and studying. Um, but it was also at the time when Thailand was going through um, a military coup and demonstrations against Suchinda. And at that time, um, I was, uh, I observed um, the demonstrations with a Niran and um, just as I was um, leaving, um, I'd heard that uh, Niran had actually been arrested um, at this demonstration. And I was um, really quite uh, worried. Um, and I, I, Marion, I think, was then um, the secretary of SEM. So I, I rang her in desperation, not really of, realizing, of course, that I got my times wrong. And I was actually rang her at two o'clock in the morning. And she was not very appreciative. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, I, I guess um, it, it, it made me realize how um, SCM in Australia is in a very privileged position in being able to um, stand up for human rights and to support um, our SEM colleagues who are facing oppression. Um, so this is to show that we are still friends. There's Tetsuro who, um, like me, has gone on to do development work. So he married a Karen, uh, ethnically Karen person from Burma um, and lived in Burma for many years um, and has done a lot of work, um, development work um, through the Japanese government. Niran has established his own um, uh, sort of farm um, in his um, village uh, called um, Eden. And um, he does a lot of development work um, and raises awareness of sustainability um, through his church up there. So I, I went to, to, to meet him. 
and yes, you can see he's aged a lot. Uh, I think all those nights drinking whiskey have not served him very well. Another person that I wanted to talk about um, that I met at Indonesia is Lillian. Lillian was uh, from SEM in Singapore and many of you will know during that period in the 1980s when the SEM of Singapore was seen as um, undermining um, the Singaporean government. They were seen as part of a Marxist conspiracy and Lillian used to tell me stories of how she was being followed by the spies and having her mail opened all of the time. And, and there were other people that we, some of us who are meeting today will know, um, were in a similar situation. Some had to flee from uh, Singapore um, to, to prevent from being um, imprisoned. So yes, Lillian became a good friend. This is, this is my family and she came to visit me um, in Albury. Um, met my family and then the, the last contact I had with Lillian was that she was working on the border um, between Thailand and Burma, supporting the Burmese refugees at that stage who were, who were fleeing and giving them support. I've, lo I've since lost contact with her, which is a great shame. So for me, the next, um, the next trip I made to Asia um, was part of my studies. So I went to Thailand um, as part of my studies and I took the advantage of going to visit the Burma SEM. And the reason for that is at that stage, um, people from Burma weren't allowed to leave so the SEMs could never join us for um, the human resources development program activities. So I really wanted to give them a chance to meet somebody from overseas who was active in SEM. It was 1988. I went there in May and I knew about the um, the riots, the student riots that had occurred in March where a number of students had been killed. And so when I visited there, um, the universities were closed. Um, and so the students had nothing to do. Um, they looked after me very well. I was very lucky in what I could do, um, which was actually, uh, not allowed, so I actually did go to Mandalay and I did go to some rural areas, um, which wasn't actually allowed um, for foreigners to do that. Um, and as a result of that, I actually wrote um, a report to Amnesty International, um, which just legitimised what probably they already knew um, about what was happening inside Burma and just uh, gave me a, a realization that again, as Australians, um, we are in a privileged position to be able to um, support human rights in the region. So that led me to become a human rights coordinator. And I've been going back over my notes. And at that time, um, Russell Peterson had been the human rights coordinator. And it was seen that Australia, um, uh, could do this, um, could support the human rights program for the WSEF Asia Pacific region, because we do have the freedom to do that. So I um, was, and WSEF has um, NGO status with the United Nations at that time. So I got the chance to go to be a part of an, a training program associated with the UN Human Rights Commission, um, along with uh, John Laidlaw, who's an SEM from Melbourne, who also went. And we um, gave an oral intervention. Um, uh, there were two that I gave. Um, one was on arbitrary detention because we had an SEM in the Philippines who had been arbitrarily detained. Um, but also um, we spoke about the situation in Burma um, and, and also um, 
East Timor. Uh, and then the, the second intervention was actually one that I did with other youth, um, international youth organizations. And in that one, um, uh, the, bit, the only bit that I really remember is that um, we spoke out against the US blockade on Cuba. Um, and because of my odd accent, I remember somebody, one of the New Zealand um, uh, embassy officials came up to find me and say, oh, are you a New Zealander? You sound like you've got a New Zealand accent. And I said, no, no, it's just my British colonial um, link with Australia. So as a result of that um, experience, um, I wrote a strategy paper on human rights and we realized that the way that we'd been managing human rights was really kind of like Amnesty. We, we, we tried to get people to, SEMers to write letters um, uh, of protest against things that were happening, but not many SEMers were able to take up um, that because they were time poor. So instead what we did is we tried to organize some uh, events uh, at a regional level um, to bring together human rights activists uh, within the SEM movements. Um, and there I met um, a number of wonderful people and one of them became another lifelong friend, um, Quintus. Um, and the picture um, down here is Quintus arriving in Adelaide. Um, and he brought his wife and daughter um, out to Australia, and uh, this is a couple of years ago, and I helped him find somewhere to live because he, um, he had about a week to be able to find a place to live, uh, which was in a, he, he was taking his daughter to school and he wanted to go to a particular school. So what does it all, all of that um, say? I guess, I, I guess the message that I wanted to convey to um, the current generation of SEMers is that um, it's wonderful, it's been wonderful for me to be part of an international movement. Um, I've really enjoyed um, the friends that I've made um, and I hope that um, Australian SEMers can continue to play an active role in the international movement and to benefit from the wonderful friendships that I've had um, and other people who are part of this meeting have had. So yeah, um, that's, uh, is, I don't know, shall I open it up for discussion now? Any comments or reflections from any of you? I'd be happy to make a, just a few comments. Yep. Um, I'd be uh, particularly interested to hear from Mandy about her work uh, with the Philippines. I think uh, there were a number of um, contacts that um, ASCM had in the 1980s, including with the uh, Philippines SCM and uh, with the uh, SCM in South Korea, which um, it just uh, helped me to, and all of us who were involved with those discussions to see, as Michael was saying, the uh, oppressive nature of, of life and the, the, uh, the lack of freedom in those countries. I, I was able to, to go to Korea for WSCF in 1980 and, and uh, it took me first to South Korea and then to North Korea. And one of the South Korean SCM members who helped me to go to North Korea was jailed for doing that, which was quite a shock to me. And it, it sort of made me very uh, cautious, or probably too cautious about uh, engaging with uh, uh, with that work. And I think with, with work and family, I haven't been able to. And, and yet it's something that is uh, like, you, you look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and and that is uh, the story that is seen in the oppression of uh, popular movements today. Um, 
yes, I, I think that's really true, Robbie. In, in Michael's photo and memories really um, echo my own in a way. Uh, I, when I first came into the SCM, some of my friends from Melbourne said, oh, we've got some uh, people coming from the Philippines, a young uh, seminary student and um, another activist and someone else uh, to talk about the Bataan proposed nuclear plant. Well, can you look after him in Sydney for a, after them in Sydney for a week? And that really uh, led to me becoming very involved in Philippine human rights matters during the Marcos time. But I think when I think back to that, that was in a long line of concern about Asia that came through the ASCM. And I think back to Sandy and um, Jim uh, Tulip, uh, sorry, Jim, <laughs> Jim Tulip, uh, uh, Jim Minchin, so who, who was very concerned about Singapore um, and Sandy and some of the amazing people that we, we were introduced to uh, through the ASCM um, in Asia Pacific, dating back to Sandy. I don't know if Sandy would like to say anything, but yes, the same thing uh, as Michael says, that the sense of great oppression at that time, a lot of military dictatorships around the region, uh, Christians often trying to side with popular movements and try and bring about greater justice and peace in their societies against huge odds and taking enormous risks and getting jailed for ridiculous things that we would take for granted that we could do in Australia, as happened in Singapore, as Michael mentioned. Um, so yes, I, I, I guess I would go back further to Sandy. I wonder if Sandy wanted to say anything. Uh, thank you, Mandy, very happy to, to talk. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Michael, for the um, reflections and, and the points of contact uh, with the history. Uh, I would say that you reminded me of a couple of uh, journeys that I made in some of your stories. I went to South Africa on the way to the Addis Ababa WSCF assembly, which was in January 1973. And in those days, if you went anywhere, then you tried to <laughs> maximize the value, the value of leaving Australia. Uh, so I went to South Africa where there were three uh, SCM people who were under a banning order um, and um, 73 was uh, very early, well, middle of the height of the apartheid regime. And uh, the unit, the, um, it was the Bayes Nowadays Christian Institute provided me with his car and a, and a driver, African driver, to go around to visit these three people. And I made uh, tape recordings of what they wanted to say with, uh, to take to the African uh, WSCF people. And uh, I, I share your sense of, uh, going through an airport with that sort of uh, contraband, as it were, uh, that, that you brought that memory back to me. The other place that I visited at the, in 1974, I think, or 73, late in 73, was South Korea, where seven Korean SCM people were in jail. And we were not able to visit them, but there was a WSCF delegation formed, and I was lucky to be a member of that delegation, uh, five people. Uh, and we met with some government officials and asked them about what they thought they were doing in uh, locking up good people for this sort of reason. And uh, that was quite an interesting confrontation. They gave us a book of prints of uh, Korean art, uh, trying to, I don't know about uh, softening stuff or what they were trying to do, but they're very nice prints. So all sorts of strange stories. And we didn't really have a track uh, for human rights work in those years. This was all experimental stuff that we were just trying to do out of solidarity. Uh, for the WSCF as a whole, uh, 1964 was the first year in which it, the, if you like, the hegemony of the Western churches in WSCF kind of um, broke a bit. And it was 1968 in Turku in Finland, where the, what we then would call the third world voice rose up saying, look, this is all very well what you're on about, but, but our reality is different. So think of it, 1968 was, was when the WSCF really took on this, this burden. So the Addis Ababa Assembly in 1973 uh, was trying to form, if you like, a new uh, vision or direction or um, policy formation for WSCF. And uh, as part of the Asian delegation, I was put on the sounding committee. And I like to tell the story of how there was a Marxist from Milan who produced a draft statement for the sounding committee 
that the WSCF was anti-capitalist and uh, uh, anti-colonialist and anti-imperialist. All very good. It sounds sounds very strong. And then the African delegate on the sounding committee said, anti-racist. I thought, yeah, yeah, that's right, that an anti-racist. And then the North American woman on the sounding committee said, anti-sexist. <laughs> and then it seemed to me that we could breathe again because we didn't just have to be in line with the, uh, the Marxist agenda uh, 100%. That there was a kind of a, a recognition that there are so many different kinds of oppression and so many different ways in which people suffer and are uh, marginalized, put down, destroyed ultimately. Uh, and that was what counted. It was, if you like, the spirit of solidarity and recognition uh, of those um, who are being discriminated by the, the principalities and powers of the present world. Uh, and that's where we should, should put our um, focus. We, don't, we didn't have to have answers in a sense. What we had to have was a sense of solidarity. And uh, that was what I took out of, of those experiences, that, that it's the relationships and the solidarity that matter and uh, trying to hold into those relationships well enough um, for the Holy Spirit to get a chance. And that's about what I can say. Yeah, um, and it, it is interesting for me to hear that too. Um, when I looked at my strategy paper um, for human rights, one of the things that um, uh, hit me about the World Student Christian Federation is the way it has developed a regionalized structure. Um, and that has given strength to the movements in the so-called the South. Um, and so the um, at that at that time, um, when I was writing that, so 1985, um, sorry, 1995, um, the um, human rights actions were strongest in Asia Pacific, in Africa, and in Latin America. And there's, there's no surprise for that. Um, but what occurred to me was that Asia Pacific had a, a unique situation in having so-called developed countries together with the developing countries. So we had Australia and New Zealand Aotearoa who could provide support um, for those movements. And I, 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 I saw the um, regionalized structure of WSEF as, as a strength to be able to um, support movements um, who, who are under oppression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris? Mm -hmm. yeah, Michael. Um, Can I just say yeah. one thing about the regionalized structure? It, yep. it started in 1970. I was actually at a meeting uh, with a Munkyu Kang from Korea and Kentaro Shizuki from Japan, two staff workers of the uh, putative region that was forming. And uh, we actually, I was actually in a meeting which helped to write you know, the rules for how we were going to operate in 1970 and I think 71 as well. Um, so that's when the regionalization took on, just as, as, as recently as that in a sense. Uh, it was definitely a project of those years following the 1968 uh, Turku assembly. That's how I date the uh, the changeover, if you like, of, of emphasis. So thank you, sorry. No, it's okay. I just wanted to also say something about that time. And I think Sandy's um, involvement, uh, you were there at a very critical time in terms of um, change and transition in all sorts of ways. And if I'm correct, I mean, Sandy was the, the, the last, person to hold the title of General Secretary, I think, of the Australian SCM. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and because uh, it, it was a time of change, including ch time of change in organisational uh, structures and ways of um, uh, appointing people to leadership and all, all of that sort of thing. And if my memory is right, Sandy was followed by um, a person with a new title in the national movement, and that title was um, international officer. It was Alison Arblaster. Was around that time. You can you might be. Alison Arblaster was the one who took on most of what I was doing. That's right, Alison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, but she wasn't general secretary. She was international right. officer, which I think illustrates the great importance that the 
Australian SEM at that time gave to our relationships with the WSCF and to international solidarity as, um, as you know, a very important part of our, our mission and what we were called to do. And I think that title international officer or WSCF relations officer or something um, continued up at least until sometime in the 1980s, I think, and then, then was replaced by the national staff worker um, role, which was a mixture of the two, I suppose. But yeah, I just, I, it's just a way of highlighting the importance of what Michael has been talking about in the life of SCM and how that was uh, identified in the 1970s. Yeah. Um, John's just texted me to say that he has to go. <laughs> um, it is six o'clock. Um, I, I guess to, to close, um, I'm thinking about what this means for the movement today. Um, Mandy, you are muted. Do we have to close? Can we um, extend? No, I, I'm just going to say bye to everyone. Oh, enjoy, John, Michael. Thanks for sharing. Good to hear from you. you as well, bye. Hi, Cindy, and bye. Okay, uh, John, can we continue? Yes, because uh, uh, Michael has. Um, yeah, I'm hosting it. That. Okay, yeah. right. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. All the best. Well, and and thank you for all your wonderful work. We know you have many, many, many stories too. <laughs> <laughs> bye for now. Bye. Bye. Yeah. So, so yeah, I was opening up a, a new area of discussion, I guess, and that is is um, building on what we've been discussing, which is really about wonderful things in the past. But what does that mean for um, SEM now, particularly given we are going through a, a sort of period now where we're having to uh, rethink what SEM is, um, have a new vision. Is that, is that what's happening, Michael? I mean, so I'm, I've been a bit out of touch with the movement in Australia and frankly with the WSCF. Um, is, is it a rethinking? Is that, is that what's happening in the national SCM at the moment or um, and how, do, how does it fit in with what's happening in the WSCF? Uh, Mandy, do you want to Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. I, I think that um, we are at an interesting crossroads because the period of John being the national coordinator is coming to a natural close. And so that, is, and also New South Wales is trying to re-establish. So um, uh, <clears throat> I think there is some rethinking going on and there is a formal review that is going to start soon. Um, but I think uh, we're trying to think about how uh, we re-strengthen, how we strengthen the ASCM we're all very conscious of the really important role that it has played for us individually and for many, many other students. So how do we strengthen that? And I think that's, that's a real review that needs to happen and is happening. And um, uh, I think there will be a new national coordinator appointed. There is a question as to whether we need any other staff appointments. There is a question of how we recognise the fact that Students, a lot of students are on Zoom a lot of the time at the moment. Our branch structure in universities is not strong, but we know that the ASCM has something important to contribute to the um, development of thoughtful Christianity in Australia and beyond. So how do we do it? Yes, there is that review. I don't know if Roz wants to say something or David wants to say something. Yeah, um, so for quite a while now, um, WSCF programs have been the way that um, probably until the last few years, for a, a, probably a good 10, 15 years, WSCF programs were one way that we got new students involved. Um, whether it was those who weren't particularly active um, to, to then send them on a WSCF program and later they became active in ASCM, which is which is what happened with me, um, or inviting completely new people um, to go on WSCF events 
um, in the hope that then they would come back and through their formation building, um, they'd also contribute to ASCM, which hasn't always happened because, um, you know, it was, it was a hope, not an expectation, I, I suppose. Um, at the moment, we've got, uh, so we've got Andika, who's, a, who's the ex-co, and we've got Yi Shin, a student in Canberra, who's on the Regional Women's Committee um, in Asia Pacific. Uh, and in the previous um, committees, uh, we had someone in the Human Rights, Justice and Peace Committee. And we've, like, we've, we regularly have ASCM as involved in WSCF Asia Pacific, not so much global. Um, in terms of what's happening, um, uh, yeah, like man, like uh, yeah, everything Mandy said. <laughs> um, we, I think we're in a transition phase. So, um, so many Christian students now are interested in social justice. Um, it's really the flavor of the month, particularly for uh, millennials. Um, so that's something that really sets ASCM apart. Um, in that we've been doing it for a long time, for a longer time than other ecumenical groups on campus. Um, our struggle, I think, is we've been growing slowly from, I think, probably before 2010 when we'd almost died at a national level. Um, we've been slowly growing again around the country. Um, and now I suppose we're in a phase where many of us have been on the national executive for quite a while, in my case, 10 years. Um, so we're very keen to get some of the younger students that are coming through our groups involved, but they're not keen. So we're trying to figure out why and what we can do to change that, basically. Um, and that's where um, the review that Mandy's leading, um, I think will be, I suppose, looking at not just a structural, in a structural sense, what do we need to do, but also as we're moving forward and into having a new national coordinator and so on, what do we need to do to attract younger students in particular who are a different, different cohort, different generation, they've really grown up with an activist mindset. What is it that they want from a student movement? Um, and that's what we're trying to figure out. I actually find that really encouraging. Um, uh, I, I, I kind of got a, a sense that the uh, you know that SEM uh, is really struggling to to exist, but knowing that there there are students who want to be involved in social justice, um, Christian students, um, there there there's potential there, and that's that's exciting, um, uplifting, um, and I, I I guess also. Um, the, the bit that I haven't really spoken about is is the, the Christian bit, the, the theology. Um, maybe it's because I'm not really active in church these days. Um, but yeah, going through some of some of these old files that I had reminded me about the um, the theology that um, that and and the wise um, readings that people gave to me um, when I was uh, young and in SEM really had a profound impact upon me. And uh, the one that relates to human rights, I guess, is um, I think it was the Christian Con uh, Congress of Asia talking about our common humanity as a driving force for human rights and that we are all made in the image of God. So any desecration of um, humans um, oppression against humans um, is a, a desecration of, of the image of God. And, and I found that quite powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the other thing is, and I think this will be back to front, so I don't know that it'll work. <laughs> the truth it shall works. make you it free. <laughs> um, this was actually given to me by, as you can see, Myanmar SEM when I visited them in 1988. And it was, it was their motto, a fascinating motto to have at that time, uh, under impression, the truth shall make you free, um, became a catch cry for me as well. And I, I've held on to that 
for, for many years, uh, even for myself, um, uh, it, it means a lot for me to speak out and to speak the truth. Um, and it does make us free to be able to do that. So that, that message drives, I guess, um, so, some of the human rights work that I, that I did during that time, that, that we have an obligation to, to speak the truth. Don't know if there's any reflections on, on, on that side of things. Um, yeah, Sandy? Uh, firstly, you remind me that that's the slogan of the American CIA, so you have to be aware of the shadow <laughs> in every good thing, as well as the good things that might lurk in the shadows that we are, are afraid of. And also the, the Czech church uh, has another similar phrase, uh, the truth shall prevail. Uh, and they speak out of a long history of um, you know, difficulty. Uh, so this sense of discerning the shadow within our best hopes is where I would go in theology. <laughs> Interpreting a biblical text, particularly the ones you really like, make sure you see how other people might hear that text and, and you'll start to see the shadow. And I've had this experience in two or three recent Bible studies that I've been involved in. Uh, just very important. And um, it's not that God is, is making the shadow. We make the shadow by our misinterpretations, by our mis you know, distortion of, of so much of, of what is good in the world. Um, and in terms of um, theology, uh, that, that's, that's my calling. I, I'm, I'm a United Church minister in retirement, like David. Um, and um, theology is what I've done all my life. And I got into this stuff I would say through theology as interpreted in the SCM. <laughs> uh, and it's, it goes back to what I'm saying about solidarity, that solidarity is recognizing a common humanity, but it's also recognizing, if you like, that God puts us together with others and um, being faithful to those relationships is critical. Uh, that, that, that's what really counts in, in the long term, as I understand it. Um, yeah. A big part of those issues is liberation theology, which was a major movement um, coming out of Latin America, especially in the 1970s and, and 80s. And it really makes me wonder, you know, what's happened to the concept of liberation theology, which I, I think is really a, a vital um, way of, uh, of just understanding the true meaning of the gospel. And we see, you know, Pope Francis has some association with uh, liberation theology. And, and yet the, uh, the idea of the Christian gospel as, as a movement of human liberation is something that seems to be very marginalized. I'd argue that ecumenically speaking, liberation theology has become mainstream. You know, that I, I just think it, it's there in, in the ecumenical uh, movement, uh, World Council of Churches and, and so on. I think it's become mainstream. How However, it, it comes up in God's preferential uh, for the poor. Uh, it comes up in just the way that they, they listen to each other. You know, these are the kinds of things that, that help it to become mainstream. Uh, it, it's certainly my view that that's what I learned in the SCM. I, I learned to understand that liberation theology was uh, a, a, such a valid expression of the gospel. As soon as you have oppression, you have you know, the challenge of uh, the liberation message. <laughs> um, and are we not all subject to oppression in, in various different forms as well? So not just political and social oppression. But anyway, that, that's to say that I, I really think that Michael's right, that theology matters and that liberation theology matters. And uh, I, I do believe it's mainstream now. That's encouraging. <laughs> I think David wanted to say something. Yep, David. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad the... Uh conversation has moved in this direction. Uh, not that I was unhappy about what Michael was, was saying. Uh, I think, Michael, you've, you've underlined uh, both the, uh, the thrill of the learning experience of encountering uh, students of other countries and other cultures facing other issues uh, and also the disturbance that that brings upon us when we, we as Australians with our mindset suddenly have to cope with what's happening to the students in Myanmar or Indonesia or wherever. Uh, 
and this is this is one of the great strengths of the student movement that it 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 brings us together across these barriers that all too often keep our people and our churches uh, quite quite far apart. So all strength to the student movement. My worries, however, is, my worry is that it this focus, if we're not careful, can can make the student movement sound as if it's a grab bag of grievances. It's a, it's a bunch of people uh, uh, who will accumulate uh, uh, problems from here and there and somewhere else, and will do their best to tackle those problems. Okay, uh, but it's more than a grab bag of grievances. It's more than a community of people who are worried about the world's problems. And that's what uh, left me sort of hanging on the edge, waiting for a little bit more, for an affirmation of what, what is it positively that drives this movement? What are we for? Not just what are we against? Okay, we're against all the wrong things, but what are we for? What's, what's really driving it all? And as we talk about the future of the student movement, I think we've got to be clearer and more focused on that uh, if this is going to make sense to a new generation. Yeah, thanks. I um... can I can I say something, Michael? Yeah, sure. Look, it's difficult to follow that challenge uh, really with saying anything useful because I don't know that I can answer David's question. But but what Michael said and what other people have said have just brought home to me how completely fundamental the SCM is and was to who I am now in so many ways that I I'm I'm 50 years old and I'm still trying to process those those impacts of the SCM on me. And my time um, in the small groups at, at, you know, in little groups at Sydney Uni, meeting people with different, different angles, different questions, different places they've come from, to visiting various parts of Asia Pacific and uh, say West Africa, the Middle East, engaging with people in those places their faiths and their struggles um, that to me it's um, those connections those human connections that were like the really primary they helped me to understand my faith at the time and they helped me to understand who I was and put that in a better in a more complete light if you grow up in Australia you know you, you have fairly narrow perceptions of um, your, the world and your, your place in it. And even, but with, even within Australia, there's such a diversity of experiences and SCM already exposed me to a lot of those just on the campus, but internationally, um, those different perspectives. And I, you know, I, I, I could talk for ages about this and so I'm gonna try to shut up, but, but to me, like it, one of the things that I've taken from SCM is, the focus on the, the people, you know, the individual people. I'm not talking about the collective, the masses, but my friend from Liberia and his experience uh, during that period in the early 19 and mid 1990s. My my friend from um, the what was then Zaire, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and his I've lost contact. But you know those those human stories that. Um, connect us. And so, you know, in my, in, this infiltrates everything I do, you know, when I'm dealing with students or staff who are, who are struggling, it's, I somehow that exposure to the SCM and the importance, and this is, um, um, resonates strongly with what Michael was saying, that, that to me is um, really what's, one of the things that's flavored the impact of the SCM on me personally. And I think that's a really important thing that it, it has to offer to the students today. Yeah, thanks. And I, I, I'm glad that you said that because I, I guess that was the message that I was trying to convey through the stories of the people that I was talking about. Um, and I don't think I really gave a good explanation of the impact that SCM has had on me. Um, but I echo what you're saying. Um, it, it, 
it's made me a, a, a really profoundly uh, good person in what I do. Um, uh, and I, I really wanted um, to be able to explain that, but I don't know that I have. And I think it's difficult to explain. Yeah. But um, yeah, and, and, and I guess what I, why I think this is such a good discussion and I'm glad it is being recorded is that I, I do hope that um, other people who join SEM benefit the way that you have, Andrew, I have, we all have. Um, the, 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 we would like SEM to continue. Um, and we're, we're, we're looking at, um, I'm seeing opportunities now that I hadn't realized before that SEM as a movement um, can continue. So I'm thinking now maybe it's some time to, to, to wrap up. Um, there's some nice closing comments that have been made. Um, so unless there's- Michael, any... I don't know if Julia wants to say anything. Julia, is there anything you'd like to say coming in afresh? Um, well, well, um, I've learned a lot today. I didn't realize how vast SCM is, um, yes. Asia Pacific and in lots of different regions. And, um, I think there, there's terrific opportunities. Um, I mean, there's even the possibility of branching out into TAFE colleges and, um, other facilities like that where there isn't much Christian movement going on at the moment. So yeah, I just found it fascinating to, to hear about the history and the connections people have made and how important that is to sustain those connections and how um, if people join together, amazing things can happen. Here, yeah, yeah. here, with the help of God, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to lend Julia Renata Howe's book on the history of the Australian student Christian movement. Mm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Wonderful, Julia. How yeah. lovely it is to see everyone. Michael, I think it's a real privilege that you've been able to share so much of these really vital um, things that have shaped your life and I think many of us hear echoes of, of, of what you have experienced. We've felt those same things in our own lives. And in a sense, it helps us have a heart of compassion for others in a bigger way than we might have had if we'd never come across the SCM. So mm. I think if God can use the heart of compassion that each of us has and use the, our minds and use our hands then uh, that's what it's all about. So we, we, I think, thank you for being so thoughtful in your in everything you've shared, and um, it resonates so much. And the importance of the oppression that so many people have faced and do face now, and how do we react to it? How do we respond as Christians in the world? Is just um, at the heart of what it means to be trying to live authentically as a Christian and as Andrew said, hopefully it, it, it has an influence in our lives, great and small. We don't know what a big thing is. We don't know what a big, small thing is. If we can treat each person that we come across um, with integrity and kindness, then we are showing something of what we hopefully have learned in the SCM and uh, hopefully what is in the heart of God. So. Thanks, Mandy. Um, Sandy, did you want to make a sort of closing comment? <laughs> um, a couple of things. But first, thank you very much, Michael, for, for, and everyone for tonight's discussion, which I think has been very constructive and helpful. And um, I think together we've managed to put together a kind of a memory of, you know, 50 years of uh, WSCF in Australia and uh, SCM. But uh, just to say that the contemporary SCM has actually done two things this year or in the last little while uh, of that international solidarity. Uh, we had a, um, a, a Zoom meeting with Indonesian friends and uh, Myanmar friends in response to the Myanmar coup. Uh, 
And that was quite, you know, within a, a few, a couple of week or two after the coup happened. Um, so we expressed what we could at that time of solidarity. And uh, uh, it's exactly the same thing we're talking about now. Look outwards, look at what's going on. And uh, if you can respond, do. <laughs> and the other thing that we uh, did in a similar way was around Philippine SCM, or uh, well, Philippine situation more than the SCM, uh, around the extrajudicial killings. When I first went to the Philippines in 1970, I think it was, maybe it was a bit later, anyway, they had extrajudicial killings. They were happening. <laughs> uh, then uh, there've been waves of these extrajudicial killings in the Philippines ever since. And it's still happening and it's still going on. And the impunity that those people feel is still there. Uh, so <laughs> do not expect quick answers, <laughs> but the solidarity is what matters. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thanks. Right, well, um, unless there's any other final closing comments. Um, thanks everybody for coming along. Uh, we have another one in a fortnight's time. Mandy's gonna find some people from WSCF to interview which I think will be fantastic build on from this. Um, and then we're gonna have a, a special uh, lecture from Karen Pack, who's uh, doing her PhD with Marion Maddox. Um, she's gonna uh, present a little bit about her research. And then David Gill um, is going to really go into that question that he raised about the student movement and the renewal. So I'm really looking forward to that. So thanks, everybody. Um, we'll end the meeting now. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.